Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning, uh, Palm Sunday. And uh, we are Coulter and Anna Brown. Um, you may have noticed my, my children. We have four children, Jedediah, Elizabeth, Graceland, and Jack, Jonathan. And um, so it's been a few years since we've been here. It's good to see some faces that I recognize and obviously some new faces as well. But great to be back with you this morning. Um, I'll ask that you put the PowerPoint up if you're able there and uh, do a little ministry update and then I'll get into God's Word here in a few minutes. Um, so we serve with Child Evangelism Fellowship and last time we were here, um, probably, I was serving as the Director of Missionary Outreach out of the International Headquarters located near St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we've had a change in uh, job uh, description role in ministry since then for four years now. Uh, I've been working again in Latin America. Uh, I serve as the Assistant Regional Director. Some of you may know Abner and Susan Panetta, my wife's parents. They are the regional uh, directors for CEF over all of Latin America. 20 countries, uh, Spanish and Portuguese speaking from Mexico, all the way down to the southern tip of Argentina and Chile. So we've been helping out, uh, helping with leadership development, helping with training, and uh, we decided to relocate four years ago. Uh, we moved to Wyoming. That's where I'm from originally. And so we're living close to my family now and we spend anywhere from three to six months a year kind of on the road in Latin America uh, helping out in the ministry. And so while we're gone, my parents can look over our home and help in that way. And then when we're back, we get to see them and uh, it's a good arrangement. So I'll have you go to the next slide. Uh, CEF exists really for three, uh, a threefold purpose, to evangelize children. We believe that uh, God can and does save children, young children. And so we want to take the message of the gospel to these children, especially those kids that are not in a local church, hearing that message every Sunday. And so in Latin America, we do that through the Good News Club, through open-air evangelism. Um, you may remember my wife and I were missionaries in Honduras for a number of years, and we would go right into the public schools, and we were on the curriculum, we had to assign a grade and everything, and we would teach Bible to, uh, I think it was around 300 kids every, um, every Tuesday. And so there's various ways that we do that, but our focus is evangelizing children with the gospel of Jesus Christ and not just that establishing them in God's Word discipling them in God's Word but we realize CF is not a church it's uh, not God's body per se in that way and so we work with other uh, with local churches trying to get those kids placed in a local church where they can grow and where they can experience the fellowship of God's people. So threefold purpose, evangelize, disciple, and establish in the local church. Next slide, please. One of the aspects of my ministry is training national missionaries, uh, people from Latin America, to serve within their own country, their own cultural context, or maybe to go and be a missionary in some other country. And so we do that through our Leadership Training Institute. This is a photo taken from an LTI we had in Argentina a few years ago. And all of these people were trained for three months of intensive college level training, how to uh, study God's Word, how to evangelize children, administrative details. And then a lot of them went back to their countries to start CEF ministry where they live. Um, we have some exciting news uh, that I'd like to share. We were planning an LTI for Brazil in 2020. Well, the pandemic hit, we had to postpone that. We were thinking, well, maybe January of 21. 
That didn't happen. We had to postpone that again. And so that kind of pushed us as an organization to think about taking our training and making it available online. And uh, so we decided to do that, make that available online in Spanish. And so Abner and a team uh, from Mexico are in Tlaxcala, Mexico today, getting ready to start uh, teaching a Teaching Children Effectively Level 1 course. Um, and we're going to be filming that and editing and developing that for our very first module of the LTI online in Spanish. So be, be praying for him, be praying for that effort. Uh, it will be two weeks uh, that they're there in central Mexico doing that. Um, and then, Lord willing, August through November, we'll be able to have an in-person uh, training in Brazil. And so we're looking forward to that. Um, next slide, please. It's kind of a bad photo, but it's the only one I could find of Mai. Mai is from Argentina, and we trained her at the Institute a few years ago. She went back to Argentina, to Cordoba, and began working in the local CEF work there. And over the years, God began to burden her and call her to do more. And so we're excited to see Mai become a, a cross-cultural missionary. Uh, she's joining the CEF regional team, and we're going to be sending her first assignment to Puerto Rico coming up soon, where she can help us um, Puerto Rico, the ministry has been in decline for a few years. I've been uh, focused on that country and having someone there on the ground will be a huge asset as we try to rebuild and restructure the ministry in Puerto Rico. Um, so, um, so we're excited to see God working in Latin America, even raising up Latin American missionaries like mine to go and serve cross-culturally. Another aspect of our ministry is leadership development, not just the reaching children or the training, but also helping uh, struggling ministries, helping mentor new directors. And, uh, and so uh, my focus has been Puerto Rico the last few years. I've made several trips there and uh, trying to work through some registration issues, trying to restart ministry to children there. And my is going to be a huge asset in that way. Um, so we're excited. We're encouraged. Even though COVID um, kind of had to change the way we did some ministry. Um, we're doing things virtually now on Zoom, Good News Clubs via Zoom. And uh, looking forward to the day when we can get back to doing those in person. Um, seeing God burden us for online training and other things. So God is good. He's working. We're seeing the fruit of his labors in Latin America. And we, we thank all of you for partnering first with my wife when she went out as a single missionary and then with us as a couple all of these years, 15 years now, I think. And uh, it's been a blessing to partner with you to reach the, the children of Latin America. Be praying for us. Pray for the training in Mexico. Pray for wisdom to know if we can really kick off the in-person training in Brazil or if we should postpone that again. And be praying for our support. Many of you support us and we're thankful for that. Um, but we are looking for additional uh, monthly financial partners. So thank you very much. Um, I want to transition now to a message. And um, if you have questions about our ministry, find me after the service. If you'd like an updated prayer card, I have those I can give you. But right now, I'd like to open God's Word and um, transition to the message. So if you would, please pray with me. Father, we thank you for your Word. Thank you that it's through your Word that you have revealed yourself to us. And so now, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would come, um, would open our minds and our ears and our hearts to your word this morning, that we might see Christ 
and that we might know him and glorify him. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week, um, I believe your pastor spoke on why did Jesus have to be a man? Why did Jesus have to be a man? And he, he asked me to talk briefly this morning about why Jesus had to be God. And that's an interesting question, isn't it? As I thought about it, how would I answer that question? How would I structure a message around that question? I realized it's a big topic, isn't it? It's, it's, it's vast. And as we consider that question this morning, I'd like to submit to you that it's one of the most important questions that maybe you can consider. This idea of Easter, Palm Sunday today, the resurrection, our redemption, Jesus coming as a man, Jesus coming as God. And so we'll be looking at a number of passages this morning. Um, our main text is going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. So if you'd like to turn there, I'd invite you to do so. But before we wrestle with this big question of why did Jesus have to be God, I think we have to answer some other questions first, don't we? Is there a, a purpose or a point to life, to our personal experience, to all of history? Did God have something in mind when he created the world? Is it going somewhere? Or is it just random? Is it happenstance? Is it what the world would tell us, a cosmic accident? I think as we wrestle with this first question, what's the point of it all? We find our answer in Scripture, don't we? We think of Genesis chapter 1. God coming and blessing Adam and Eve and saying, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, exercise dominion over all of creation was as if God was saying, Adam and Eve, I've created you and creation, really, to maximize my glory. I want every corner of the globe filled with people who will know me, who will take care of my creation, who will glorify me, and who will delight in me. But we know that Adam and Eve ultimately rebelled against that purpose, didn't they? They sinned in the garden by disobeying God, listening to Satan. And God again came and he, he gave a foreshadowing of his plan when he was cursing the serpent. He said, Cursed be you above all the livestock of the earth. On your belly you shall crawl all the days of your life. And as it goes through that curse, the very end it says, But I will send a Savior who will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but he'll crush your head. Foreshadowing a glimmer of hope in the dark reality of life. Well, as we continue thinking about the purpose, was God's purpose foiled? Was his plan disrupted? Did God have to come up with a new idea for this purpose of People who knew God and loved God in every corner of the globe, worshiping Him and glorifying Him, we see the flood that ultimately destroying that creation. And then we see God coming and talking to Noah and his sons and saying, Noah and your, son, your sons, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and exercise dominion over it. The very same purpose, the very same plan. God reiterated or reinstituted to Noah and his sons. We see the fleshing out of it when God calls Abraham. Abraham, I'm calling you to leave your people. I'm going to make you into a great people so that all the families of the earth will be blessed. We see the fleshing out of that even more when God comes to David and says David had a desire to build a temple for God. And God says, no, David, you're not going to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. Someone from your lineage, one of your descendants, will sit on the throne forever. 
And so we see God throughout the pages of history working out his plan. Not plan B, not plan C, but God's original intention for the world. Ultimately, we see the fulfillment of God's plan when we skip ahead to the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. There's a great cloud of witnesses, people from every tribe and tongue and language, bowing down before the Lord, worshiping God, crying out, worthy are you. And that's been God's plan from the very beginning. So is there one unifying theme throughout all of Scripture? What is the meta-narrative that we can sink our teeth into? Has God's plan been thwarted or changed? No. God's purpose has always been the same. Uh, the Westminster Catechism puts it this way, What is the chief and highest end of man? The answer, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully enjoy Him forever. And so as we consider, continue thinking about why did Jesus have to be God, another question comes to mind. Well, what about mankind? What is the condition of mankind? Could this Savior promised so long ago in Genesis be a human uh, solely? Could a man satisfy this requirement? What is the condition of man? Well, as we look at Scripture, uh, Psalms 14, 1 through 3, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Psalms 53, 3, they have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. They are is none who does good, not even one. And then Romans 5, there's that beautiful passage that talks about Adam being our representative and bringing in sin when he fell, and as a result, all of mankind have fallen, and their nature is corrupted, their... Um, opposed to the things of God, they're spiritually dead, there's none who does good, and so by nature of our first representative, Adam, we know that all of mankind, you and I, everyone, is corrupt. There is no man that can satisfy the righteous and holy requirements of God. That relationship was broken in the garden, and we died spiritually, separated from God forever. So is there a unifying theme? Yes, God wants to be in relationship with people who will know Him, who will delight in Him, and as a result will glorify Him. But that was broken in the garden, and man's condition has been corrupted. We're dead. We're in opposition to God. And so we think, well, what about the Mosaic Covenant God made with Israel? Was that sufficient to purchase our redemption? When we look at the Mosaic Covenant, again, we see that no, it fell short, it was not sufficient. Isaiah 26, 18, it's this passage about, I believe it's uh, Judah going into captivity. And it's as if they're being led away out of Jerusalem, looking back over their shoulder and weeping. And it says, we were pregnant, as it were, with God's blessing. We had the word of God, the law of God, the blessing of God. We grew larger with the blessing. But instead of giving birth to a blessing for the nations, it says, we writhed, but we have given birth to the wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth. God was not known in every corner of the earth through Israel. They hoarded the blessing. They didn't share the blessing. The covenant was insufficient to bring about God's purpose in the world. Hebrews 3 says, Consider Jesus.
Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Hebrews 8, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Jeremiah 31, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one of teach his neighbor, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So was the covenant God made with Israel sufficient to accomplish his purpose in the world? No. Israel ultimately rebelled against God, broke the covenant, and God had in mind a better and a new covenant. Again, I go to the Westminster Catechism. With whom was the covenant of grace made? Thinking about the new covenant. The covenant of grace was made with Christ as the second Adam, and in him with all the elect as his seed. So God's purpose remains the same, even though Adam failed in that original mandate that God gave to him, the cultural mandate. Ultimately, even though Noah and his sons failed, even though Noah and his seed, the nation of Israel, rejected and fell away, God's purpose still stands. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came. Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 44, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, capital R, the Lord of hosts. I am first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Matthew 1.23 Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. John 1 And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. Jesus has made him known. Jesus is God, God the Son. And Jesus came, yes, as a man, but he came as God to fulfill the promise that God gave to Satan so long ago. <coughs> ultimately to fulfill the law, the Mosaic law that God had given to the people of Israel, to fulfill all the prophecies that God had given in uh, those wonderful prophetic books that we can read. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan from the very beginning. Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is God, God the Son. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus speaking, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, 
have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Was Jesus God? Absolutely. Scripture is clear. Jesus is God. The Nicene Creed, I believe, skipping ahead a little, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And so did God have a purpose for his creation? Absolutely. God is a relational God. God wanted to glorify himself through creating people that would know him and love him and care for his creation, who would be his image bearers. And God did not set that purpose aside. In fact, God has brought more glory to himself through redemption, through the fall, than he could have other, any other way. If there had been another way, God would have done it, wouldn't he? And so now we get to our critical question this morning. Why did Jesus have to be God? And I think we're ready to wrestle with this question. We're understanding kind of the, the, uh, the, the narrative of Scripture. Hebrews 10, verse 4 through 11. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices, and offerings, and burnt offerings, and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same Sacrifices which can never take away sins. So why did Jesus have to be God? Because only God can take away the sins of you and I. Adam was insufficient to do it. Moses, as faithful as he was as a servant of God, was insufficient to accomplish it. David, the great and mighty king of Israel, was insufficient. But all throughout the story of Scripture, God had promised, I will do it. I will glorify myself through the Messiah, through the one that I will choose, who I will raise up, who will break the power of death and sin and the curse and who will bring mankind back into relationship with me. The sacrificial system of Israel was a type of what was to come, was insufficient. The blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient to take away sin. And so God himself came in the person of Jesus, in the body that God had prepared for himself, Jesus came to accomplish the atonement, to bring about our redemption, but ultimately to glorify God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, by exalting the name of Jesus above every other, every other name, seating him at the right hand of the throne of God, and causing his people, you and I, those that know Jesus, have trusted in that sacrifice 
to delight in Christ, to find our satisfaction in Him, to find our, our help and our support and our future in Christ, and by doing so, to glorify God. As we continue, let's look at verse 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Why did Jesus have to be God? Because it was the only way for God to maximize his glory, to fulfill his purpose for creation, and to redeem for himself, through his blood, a people for God. And as we come to this time of year, I trust that the, the resurrection, the crucifixion, and then the resurrection is in the forefront of your minds. Easter, the highest holiday that a Christian has, more important even than Christmas, the resurrection. The very power of God working in Christ Jesus raising him from the dead as the first fruits, so that you and I have the hope that in Christ we will be raised from the dead as well. That the sting of death will be broken, that the curse will not pertain to us, that we will be with God where he is in the heaven one day, the day of Christ's return. We look forward to it, don't we? So why did Jesus have to be God? Because it was God's plan. And more than that, it was the only way to accomplish God's purpose for creation. Jesus came as God to glorify the Father. And Jesus wants you and I, through faith, to embrace the only sacrifice that's sufficient to cover our sins. Jesus wants to bring us into the new covenant where we will personally, personally know God, where God's word will be written on our hearts, where God's spirit will be living within us so that we know God, so that we properly and appropriately care for his creation and so that we maxim maximize the glory of God in this life and then the life to come. <coughs> Why was it requisite that the mediator should be God? It was requisite that the mediator should be God that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God and the power of death and give worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience and intercession, and to satisfy God's justice, procure, procure his favor, purchase a peculiar people, give his spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to everlasting salvation. Westminster Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism puts it this way, why must he also be true God, so that by the power of his divinity he might bear the weight of God's anger in his humanity and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life? 
So, in conclusion, what does this actually mean for me and for you? Does it have a practical application? Is it just intellectual? Um, no, it absolutely does. You and I are born under the curse of Adam. A fallen, sinful nature, you know, unable to engage with a spiritual God. We're dead, spiritually dead. We're separated from God and unable to enter into the purpose that God has established for all of creation. We cannot glorify God. We cannot know God. We cannot enjoy God. And we cannot appropriately exercise dominion over the creation in our natural state. We know that God's covenant with the people of Israel was insufficient to bring about this blessing, spiritual blessing for all the nations of the earth. And so God came into our world in the person of Jesus Christ as a man, fully God, to purchase, to bring about <coughs> redemption, atonement, atoning for sin, breaking the curse of sin, bringing about spiritual life, causing us to once again enter into what we were created for. And in faith, through faith in Christ, through his death and his resurrection, through his shedding of blood, our sins can be forgiven. We can be born again. We can have spiritual life. We can know God. We can enjoy God. We can glorify God. Verse 24, it says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Brothers and sisters this morning, I trust that you've been encouraged as we've just briefly considered this question. Why must Jesus be God? It's for the glory of God. It's for our good. It's for our satisfaction. Um, Jesus came as God to do what only God could do on the cross and through the resurrection to bring us back into relationship with Him. What is the chief end of man or what is the purpose of creation? Man's chief end is to glorify God and fully enjoy Him forever. You know, the more you know Christ, the more you enjoy Him, the more you enjoy Him, the more you want to know Him and talk about Him and share Him and share His glory with others, and the more God is glorified in you. It's an upward spiral. It's an upward spiral. And that is the purpose of life and creation, history, your personal existence. Know God. You can know him because God came down and purchased your atonement and he will redeem you through faith in Jesus Christ. And you will be satisfied in him and you will delight in him and you will ultimately glorify him. And that's what God is after. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for just this very brief look at the question, why must Jesus be God? Encourage our hearts. Teach us the truth of your word. Help us to know you and to delight in you and to glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.